Franklin Roosevelt was born January 30th, 1882, to James Roosevelt and his wife, Sarah Delano, both of prominent Hudson River Valley families. Franklin was their only child together. The rural setting of this youth was a quiet enclave and rapidly industrializing. His early education was by governesses and tutors, giving him a little contact with children his age other than neighbors and relatives. Franklin traveled frequently to Europe with his parents, lived in New York City during the winter months, and spent summers at their home on the Canadian island of Campobello. To young Franklin, whose father passed on to him his love for the outdoors, the estate's woods and fields were paradise. Spring would remain the center of life until he left for boarding school at 14. After James Roosevelt died in 1900, Sarah and Franklin, then a freshman at Harvard, continued to live in the house. When he married distant cousin Anna Eleanor Roosevelt in 1905, the young couple moved in with Sarah, in whose name the house remained until her death in 1941. At Harvard, there were social disappointments, and Franklin's academic record was unremarkable. He did, however, make a niche for himself as editor of the Harvard Crimson, the school newspaper. He graduated in 1904. The following year married Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt niece of President Theodore Roosevelt. Of the he served in Washington throughout World War I, then ran for vice president on the Democratic ticket with James Cox in 1920. They lost, but Roosevelt had stepped up onto the national stage. In 1921, he contracted polio and never walked again unaided. He was 39. Roosevelt's native optimism was for the first time severely tested, but reserves of strength unsuspected by others, perhaps even by himself, came into play. He labored through the years of therapy, adapting mentally and physically to his condition. Eleanor also labored to keep his political career alive, writing countless letters, making contacts, traveling, and becoming his eyes and ears in places he could not go. The National Recovery Administration, the National Labor Board, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Works Progress Administration, TVA, Social Security, to name some of the New Deal programs grew out of this belief. When war broke out, much of FDR's efforts went to building an alliance that would defeat the Axis powers. As the conflict drew to a close, FDR put his faith on the United Nations as the world's best hope for avoiding another global war. He was preparing a speech for the UN's Charter Conference when he died of a cerebral hemorrhage in Warm Springs, Georgia. On April 12, 1945. His last words were, I have a terrible headache. He was buried at Springwood Yesterday, in the Rose Garden. Yesterday, September 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with the nation, and the, and the solicitation of Japan was still in conversation with the government and its emperor looking forward to the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. Indeed, one hour after Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing on the Toa, the Japanese ambassador to the United States and his colleagues delivered to the Secretary of State a formal reply to the recent American message. While this reply stated that it seemed use useless to continue the existing diplomatic negotiations, it contained no threat or hint of war or armed attack. It will be reported that the distance of Hawaii from Japan makes it obvious that the attack was deliberately planned many days or even weeks ago. During the intervening time, the Japanese government has literally sought to deceive the United States by false statements and expressions of hope for continued peace. The attack yesterday on Hawaii, Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. Very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. I ask that Congress declare that since unprovoked and this startling attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, the state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched attack and attack Malaya. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Wake Island. This morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. 
Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and will understand the implications to and the very life and safety of our nation. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, I have dedicated that all measures be taken for our defense. Always will we remember the character of the onslaught against us. No matter how long it may take us to overcome the mediated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through the abs to absolute victory. I believe I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only offend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never endanger us again. Hostilities exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us, God. I ask that Congress declare that since the unprovoked and distardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, the state of war has existed between the United States and Japanese Empire.